Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Oh, come on, that's rather sick. Good evening. Good evening. It's a. Uh, I, I know what it was. You were exhausted by the lengthy introduction, and uh, so the energy's back. Thank you, Wayne, for those words. Seriously, being here with you and Anne and the congregation and. Uh, the leadership team that partners with you and enjoying the ministry of worship, participating with you. All this is a very fulfilling thing. Anna and I uh, came early. We left uh, uh, Friday from home. We have a group that's arriving on uh, Tuesday evening, but we came early. Uh, as much as for any reason, we usually come a day or two early, but we came an extra day earlier uh, this time because of Wayne's invitation. And he and I served together on a a couple of uh, groups that are touching uh, the whole world and bringing the leaders of the body of Christ together for the purpose of evangelism and interaction and penetration of the darkness in our day. And uh, it's always a joy to be with him. And uh, anything, I, I, I always trust his words of kindness toward me. The issue is not that those are required to nice remarks, but I know that they're sincerely felt uh, I feel very much the same of a deep regard for him. The difficulty which uh, uh, befalls you if you are the second person to say words of commendation, it sounds as though it's merely a courteous response you feel obligated to give. But uh, the leader of this church is a leader in the global church. And many of you may not be aware of that because local congregations don't usually think about that being the case. What you are very aware of is that this congregation is visited by most of the globe through the course of the year. And so uh, you have an international influence uh, by your very existence. And it's a point of rejoicing always to be here at King of Kings. And uh, I have, as always I do when I come to Israel, uh, my girlfriend, uh, she's with me. We've uh, been together for, we celebrated the 60th anniversary, not of our marriage, but of our meeting and of our beginning to go together in September and uh, we got married two years later and so my bride of 50 years 58 years ago honey stand up and this is Anna and uh, look at all the people slowly <laughs> uh, as uh, we got married when we were 20 and so uh, uh, 58 years, uh, I'll, give, I'll leave the math to you. It's stunning and uh, not the least gra aggravating. I love every year of, of growth and development in the life of Jesus and the fellowship of the body. And the one thing uh, many of you here uh, that are familiar with me have uh, never seen me with this accessory. I usually have, uh, I brought this one because of on our tour, I wanted something that had no give to it in this uh, uh, wooden one, which is really quite stout, will be good when we get off the trail some places where our uh, visits will take us in this coming two weeks uh, when our group arrives. And, uh, but I usually have a, a little more narrow black cane that I will use. I don't need it all the time. Uh, I had a very serious surgery a year and a half ago. The residue of that has, uh, is diminishing all the time. And there's a little bit of imbalance that I, I still have. Most of it's gone now. It's not in my theology, thankful, <laughs> thankfully. But uh, it's become imbalanced in terms of my sense of security in walking, going upstairs. And so you saw my being helped up the stairs like an old man, and I am one, uh, is appropriately assisted. And, uh, but I've decided, I think, that when I don't need the cane anymore, because I'm within... In fact, I, if I'm at anywhere just level, I don't, I don't use the cane. I, today I had to go over to one of the supermarkets, well, one of the malls, and buy a couple of things I'd forgotten, and, and I didn't use it at all there. And so, but I still, uh, I think I will still carry it and use it even when I don't need it at all anymore. <laughs> That's probably within the next two or three months. And I think the reason I'm going to do that is because I, I think, I'm, tell me, I, I think I look rather dapper <laughs> with it. You know, it, it has... It has a touch, and uh, so I'm going to uh, continue to use it, but I uh, will not need it uh, any more of the time that I'm up here. I'll just uh, go ahead. Oh, would you like to use my cane? <laughs> <laughs> you 
You've comforted my heart seeing someone else do what I've done more times than not of recent date. Uh, I asked Wayne if I had ever uh, uh, on occasion being here. I think I've spoken here twice. There was that one time, three times. And, uh, but uh, uh, one of the things I've done through the years, and I, I, I just thought all of a sudden I didn't have any cards here with me, but I, I read birthday cards. And there's a story behind my doing that, the discovery that doing it with a congregation is something that has some dividends of at least uh, collateral feelings of fun for a minute before we get down to work. Although I won't say there's anything unenjoyable about anything we've done tonight. But uh, it's another thing of letting people know what is obvious to them that it's obvious to you too, that the years are accumulating at an amazing rate. And uh, so, as I said, I've never made any effort to... Uh, to hide my age ever and with our congregation just by the very fact of their being mentioned I was having another birthday people started sending cards it is no exaggeration of course the church on the way became a pretty large church while we were there many thousands and uh, but my last birthday at the church before we concluded and established the Kings uh, which is the name of our school Kings University and uh, training people entirely for ministry is what it's given to and uh, as we uh, began the school now 15 years ago and concluded at the church, the first three years was a transition time, but as we did that, uh, then that was that last time was that many years ago, 12, 13 years ago. And I, I got, and not because we were leaving, it's just the number had grown, I got over 700 birthday cards. <laughs> uh, and it's a kind of embarrassing when you look at that stack of cards that came to you and realize the awful amount of money that was just spent by people, 35 to 50 cents a piece, uh, mounding up there, it caused you to feel guilty and that you needed to at least translate it into a missionary offering of your own in payment back to God for what was uh, stolen from him by my birthday. <clears throat> I don't know that it was stolen from him, but it certainly was embarrassing. Look at the cards, but a lot of funny ones in it. And through the years, I've accumulated some. And I'm going to uh, give you just a couple here, and we'll get down to work, but I've found that it's, it's worth it, okay? You ready for this? Ready. Well, that's not enough, so I'm not going to bother with it. <laughs> no, it's too late now. I gave you a change. I'll give you one more chance. Are you ready for it? Yeah! That really didn't sound sincere. <laughs> I'm being suckered, not responded to. Uh, make a birthday card. You do it like this, like this. It's not a prayer. It's a birthday. <laughs> Over on the side. Yeah, maybe you read birthday cards like this by the gift of discernment. I don't know. But uh, at any rate, uh, I, when I go inside, uh, we're going to rehearse this. When I go inside and the punchline comes, where you, so it goes like this, okay? Um, and I turn inside and da 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 then laughter. You're ready for it, you can relax. This card says, Happy birthday. Say, you the man. Yeah, you the man. Indeed, you are the man. You the old man, but you the man. <laughs> another, another card uh, on the front of it, it says, uh, for your birthday, it's a time for remembrance. It's a time to think of the wonderful things that have happened through the years. So for your birthday, just remember one thing. Come on, you can do it. Just, just, <laughs> just <one. laughs> On the front of this, there's pictures of the giant redwood trees that are in the northern part of our state. Our home is in Los Angeles, Northern California. Some of you are aware of the fact that there are uh, enormous trees there that uh, says every time I think of, uh, of the beauty of the redwoods growing there in the northern part of California, the way they've stood there magnificently year after year, century after century, their beauty overwhelms me. Thank you for planting them.
this, uh, this could go on, but uh, I'll spare you. I think I may give you one more. Are you familiar with who Garfield, the cartoon character, is, the cat? Now, this may uh, be my last time to speak here, having told this one, but we'll make a run at it anyway. Garfield's on the front of this card, and he says, he said, uh, I'm not saying you're old. Happy birthday. But not saying you're old, I must observe this much, that if you ever park in my driveway, I'm going to put a pan under you. <laughs> not saying you're old. So uh, some in the room can sympathize with this, having accumulated years with me. I was uh, fairly well settled in what I was going to speak with you about. And this morning, when uh, we got up for the first time since we arrived yesterday afternoon, and I was, uh, I was always moving the first day back, step out on the balcony. In fact, when I went and sat down and began to journal the things that I felt after a time of worship around 4 o'clock in the morning on the balcony, and just reveling in the sense of being here in his land and in his city, and the uh, sense of the, uh, the awesome uh, beauty of knowing the Lord and of understanding the significance of this place, it not just being fascinating by reason of travel or by reason of some pieces of history, but because of the eternal destiny of all things that hinge at this site for the one place on earth that God has put his name in the way that he has here and the one land he selected his own. And it's always deeply moving to come back. This is my 41st time to travel to Israel, 38 of which we brought a group with us and uh, the other times were for different purposes. But as I uh, stood there this morning and then came in, I uh, opened my journal to write down some thoughts that I had and I was feeling the emotion of the moment and uh, just noting the, uh, the date, the, the 25th of November, I realized we were just one month from the celebration time of the traditional date of the birth of the Lord Jesus, Yeshua. And as I uh, thought about that, I felt that I, it was a prompting and I just meditated on it before the Lord and uh, felt drawn to a text that was not my plan for being with you this evening. So I'm going to do that because it seemed to come with such a clarity and certainty. And uh, I only mention that to you because I believe that sometimes by a simple alert like that, that there will be people who particularly would not have necessarily tuned because uh, always having guests, and I know you frequently have guests here by reason of those who come through, uh, but... Uh, I, as having pastored my, virtually my entire life, still do meet with a group of 25 to 35 pastors for a week, uh, one week every month, nine months a year, and continue pastoring pastors as they come and spend time with me. It's a different group every month, and there's been over 6,000 do this over the last 13 years from over 90 denominations and networks they've come and from uh, over 25 or 30 nations, I don't know the last count, and spend a week talking about pastoring. And uh, I have a great heart for shepherds, and uh, I thank the Lord for the one you have here. And when you have someone else, uh, it uh, shows a certain amount of patience and grace, if not tolerance, especially when you get the old ones. And uh, when I was this morning moved to that, I felt that I wanted, in a, with a shepherd's heart, to sort of alert, uh, not in the sense of an obligation to me to be prophetic, but a sensitivity of both of us to particularly hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, this one this evening. And I want to talk to you about God's way of redemptive entry. Would you say those words? God's way of redemptive entry. Say it once more, please. God's way of redemptive entry. There is, I believe, in the Bible, a single person who characterizes the way God always works when he's going to enter a situation and bring redemption to it, to make it available. There's a pattern. 
And the pattern is established in a passage of scripture, which when I read it will uh, be very familiar to all of us because it's rehearsed regularly as we come to the celebration of the season just ahead of us a month away. That point of redemptive entry was a little uh, Jewish girl named Mary. And the coming of the world's redeemer who came through her to the world, came by the hand of Almighty God by a supernatural means, came with the precursor of an announcement, an announcement that called her to a decision to respond. One that at first she was so amazed and bewildered by the marvel of what was told her. She would have been very aware of the prophecy of Isaiah, as we find it in the scriptures, as chapter 7, 14, and most of you are aware of that. It would have just been something she would have heard spoken about, common to the understanding of the people, that Messiah would come and he would be born coming through a virgin. And to even have, knowing that, knowing that the miracle was prophesied, and suddenly being confronted with the message that the Redeemer, the deliverer of Israel, would be born through her body miraculously, and that the Redeemer of the world would come by that way because of his kingdom there would be no end as the angel messenger was going to say to her. All of this would be very bewildering to a country girl from a village called Nazareth. It's rather overwhelming to whatever she was doing that day to suddenly be encountered by a messenger of God who announces himself and says that I'm here to speak to you, blessed are you, you have found favor with God. And she would have been, as we use in the language of the times today, blown away by this. And she's bewildered. And this is not something that you, any one of us, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us and says, you are the instrument that I want to use to do something that is unimaginable to you. You are the instrument I want to use to make a difference that brings an entry of my redemptive delivering grace into a situation. It may be merely a simple case of a person-to-person -person encounter. It may be something that has to do with the call of God on your life to serve. And many times we feel like Mary, disqualified. Who am I to think I could do that? and to teach you serve in your own congregation, even in an inconspicuous way. In fact, the whom, and I some, the whom I may sometimes be, I can't imagine how I could work it out or make it fit in the schedule. But there comes the gentle prodding, the confrontation recurrently, and the announcement is something that if it came one time being repeated over and over, we can begin to feel guilty and wonder who, are, who am I or how can I work this out? When it's a virgin birth that's going to happen through you, you can't work it out. It's going to take something beyond you. And so the whole episode of that one encounter in itself is a picture that years ago I had the unique experience. I was serious about my pastoral leadership, serious about my study, but in the busyness of the season years ago, I came to the day before Christmas Sunday. And as I came to that point of celebration, I, uh, it was several days before the celebration of Jesus' birthday, but as I came to that point, I was suddenly aware that the, it's, it's Saturday, I don't have a message, and I had time to get one, but I felt a little embarrassed because I usually begin my first research for my message after a day off on Monday, and then Tuesday would begin working through the course of the week to prepare my message for the weekend, the main message. Other studies would be added on the midweek and on the Sunday evening, but that was the way it was in my years of pastoral ministry. And in that moment, I felt almost guilty, and I said, Lord, you know how busy the week has been, and I'm not calloused or careless about my attention to your word or the flock I serve, and I ask you to give me your word. And the Lord spoke this to my spirit. 
He said, wish them a Merry Christmas. Now I realize that the term Christmas is not as commonly used in the environment of this, but please forgive me and understand I'm not insensitive to the fact you're, uh, you, many of you do not use that and may even feel it's awkward to use it at all. But I don't think of it as a pagan holiday. I think of it as a time of high celebration of the glory of God. If the birth of the Savior was anywhere near that date and the angels sang from heaven, I figure it's appropriate to pick some day, some time, to have a celebration and declare the glory of the one who came from heaven. And so uh, that is in that spirit that we always celebrated it and not because we're dictated to by something of pagan tradition. And uh, I understand those things and that will end my defense or apology if it's necessary at all. But suffice it to say that as I uh, had the Lord say to me, I wish you a Merry Christmas, the distinction thing of it, distinctive, th distinctive thing of it was the picture in my mind were the words when he showed them to me and spoke those words to me. Tell the congregation you wish them a Merry Christmas, but it was spelled M-A-R-Y and not M-E-R-R-Y. To wish them a Merry Christmas. And immediately, he began to unfold the message to me. I'd never thought about it before. And I sat and began to make notes as the Lord gave me a message on that occasion. It's become a book. It's entitled The Mary Miracle, and it's been fairly widely distributed since it was first published probably 20 years ago. But at any rate, I want to talk to you about it. And not necessarily because we're broaching the season, because it's a timeless truth. It can happen in any time, any circumstance. And the Lord comes to you and surprises you by saying, you to man, <laughs> or you to woman, because I have something I want to do with you of an entry of my life in and through you with redemptive power. And I will tell you the pattern is always the same. To begin with, it's not just a play on words, but what Mary was told would happen to her was inconceivable to her mind that she could conceive a virgin-born child. And how many times that the Lord will speak to you or me about something he wants to do with us and we cannot imagine it of ourselves. Well, that was her case. And I want to walk through two or three things about this matter of our hearts being opened to the Spirit of God coming to us the same way that the angel Gabriel came to Mary and brought the word and spoke very clearly that I have come from the throne of God. It was a thus saith the Lord. And I come with a certain boldness tonight of the sense of certainty that was breathed into my heart this morning that you're not obligated to respond to on the grounds of my authority, but only I would sensitize you that I feel a boldness to speak and to say who and where and what? Who here may the Lord be speaking to this evening? Where will it involve you and what will be the cost to you? Because there was a cost to Mary. And I want us to talk about that this evening. When the angel spoke to her, and I'll read the text now just briefly, it's not very long, as the uh, first chapter of the Gospel of Luke in verse 26. Scripture says in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said, rejoice, highly favored one. Say those words, please. Rejoice, highly favored one. Let me talk about those words as they occur right there. Those exact words occur in the same sense that they're spoken in verse, uh, 50, verse uh, 30 as well, where it says, you have found favor with God. Those same words, and they, even the very form of the verb, occur in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, and where the Bible says in uh, the translation I have in hand, it says you have uh, been blessed with all spiritual blessings and goes on later on to describe how that we have been accepted in the blood, but this acceptance. And that acceptance literally means graced with grace, graced with grace. And this is what was being said to her, you've been highly favored, you have been graced with grace. I point that out, 
not only because it's an interesting recurrence of the use of the verb, which is a few other places in the New Testament, but the form occurs in exactly the same way here to Mary that it does in Ephesians chapter 1, which is written to all believers. So that favor that was spoken to her is parallel addressed to us, not, uh, certainly not in the physiological ways of the implications that came with her, but in the redemptive implications. Let me say it again. The Lord spoke to her and it involved a physical miracle taking place with a spiritual reality inherent in it. For us, we're talking about answering to a call that will be a word about God's call for us to open up to something within our hearts, in our being, just as she was called to open and to believe what God would bring about in her womb for delivery, he will birth within us in embryo form and begin to grow in us that which will make us instrumentally available to serve the deliverance of something God has for someone and what their need is. Everybody's tracking with me so far. Wave at me, will you please? You go, okay, are you with me? The Mary miracle is a very profound analogy. And it's something that I believe is so clear in the scripture. It's not a matter of straining for an idea. It's something that there's a pattern that is crystal clear. And the clarity of that verb, you've been graced with grace. You have found favor is true of every one of us. If you have never known, come to know the Lord personally, his grace reaches to you. And he wants to, by that grace, grace you with the grace of his salvation as you open to and receive it. She will make a choice to openly receive what's being promised to her. And I'm going to talk about that with dual implications. It will be the grace that will enable you to be what he wants to do in and through you as an instrument of his who knows him, just as Mary was a believer and who knew uh, the, the, the traditions of the Jewish order of things in that time, she would have been considered a woman of faith, just as those of us who know Messiah now and understand Messiah has come and Yeshua, the Savior, is here. And as we have opened to him, we have received the grace of God that's offered. There is a grace that is offered to those that have never opened to it. It's possible you're here this evening, and that's the case with you. When we conclude, I'm going to ask Pastor Wayne to give some directive in regard to how you might respond. We never would do that to embarrass you, nor to suggest we think we're better than you because we've received the grace of God. The fact of the matter is, every one of us are in the same club. We're sinners that need a Savior. And being sinners that need a Savior, the difference is if you've received one. If you received the Savior, there's only one. He verified it, the one that came from the throne of God, incarnate in human form, and came to bring redemption, forgiveness, the covering, the purchasing back to God for us. And if you never received that, you know that. And you're not being asked to receive a religion. You're not being asked to go to some uh, participate in some tradition. You're being called to reality of a relationship with the living God, the Most High. And so it comes through his son, the Savior. And as the Savior came, then he opens to us the path of life, and you're welcome to receive him. He proved he's who he said he was as the Redeemer by his resurrection from the dead, and he's available to you. Grace for the grace. That grace has been provided for it to become grace in your life. The majority of us have received him. And as this message then focuses on her and the word that came to her, it continues by his saying, you're blessed among women. And when she saw him, the angel, she was troubled at the saying and considered what matter of greeting, greeting this was. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can these things be since I do not know a man? Can this be since I... Uh, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. 
Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. It's now the sixth month for who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible, literally. For with God, no word of God is unattended by the power to fulfill it. Literally the text. Nothing is impossible. No word that he speaks is unattended by the power needed to fulfill it. With God, nothing is impossible. And Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. Her choice is in the last words of the text. They're preceded first by the stunning summons that you have found favor with God. There is a grace that is available to work in your life, but you are the avenue. The choice has been you. You understand the objective of the message is not rehearsing history. The Bible, when we speak of it as the eternal word of God, is not just durable in the sense of its lastingness, but timeless in terms of its applicability. When God works in history, he works in history as we read in the scriptures to show us how he does things. That God shows how he works in certain situations in order, if we face such situations, that we know that he has shown himself strong to work that way in such situations. We come to historical narrative and do not simply draw interesting analogies. We come to historical narrative and say, there it is, the eternal God took action to show you this is the kind of thing he does in the face of those kind of things. Here he is wanting to bring redemption into the world. And there's a world that you and I live in, each one of us of our own private world. And there's a world that's lived in by people that we know and circumstances around us where redemption, God wants to enter with it and he's looking for an agent. Agency by which he may move in there in a way that there is a person through whom something of his life is incarnate by their very existence and life, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in them. This message is basically that. I'll comfort you by telling you about, I'm about two-thirds of the way through it already. Turn one another and say, those are comforting words, aren't they? Go ahead. I say I'm two-thirds of the way through the message. I probably ought to tell you that uh, Anna and I were on a flight to Chicago from Los Angeles not long ago. And uh, we got on the plane, and the guy came on, the pilot came on, and he welcomed us on board. We'd taken off, and he said, it's going to be about a a three-hour, 45-minute flight to Chicago. The airport's good weather. Looks like we're lined up for an on-time arrival, and it was, you know, just good to hear. We got about uh, 25 minutes out, and he says, well, we're the flight attendants are going to be coming through the cabin, and they're going to be preparing for our landing, and so if you'll give them your time and uh, cooperate with them, uh, the, everything's set, we're there. Well, about five minutes later, he came back on the horn and he said, he said, we just got a message from the tower that there's a traffic tie up. And he said, we're gonna have to go into a holding pattern. And we were in a holding pattern for 25 minutes. And uh, I, I just thought I'd tell you about that. <laughs> but uh, we're two-thirds of the way of the message, at least as of now, two-thirds of the way through. (laughs) When Mary responds and the angel says, you will conceive in your womb, the intimacy of the very expression is something I want to point out because it's something when God deals with this way, he will touch you intimately. It'll, of course, be in our hearts. Because he wants something to be fixed there that will cause our hearts, if you will, as a womb does, to begin to be enlarged, to be stretched to contain what it is that he wants to do through us. And it calls us to that. There's probably not many of us that have walked with the Lord very long, but that he's done that in some regard, one time or another. The number of times that I've found the Lord calling me to 
let my heart be stretched. For example, this evening, uh, one of the earlier participants were speaking to us and made reference to the, the need of forgiveness being in our hearts. Every one of us will have situations. In fact, you could be here this evening and where God wants to work redemption through you has to do with the redemption you've already tasted of and finding hard to relay. That you've been forgiven as I have, so great a debt, and been forgiven of everything, but there's someone that we hold hostage by reason of pain, I understand it, and I may not understand the depth of the pain of what it is that you find difficulty forgiving, or it may be far less than pain. It could just be irritation or inconvenience. And there's this snag in your own soul called relaying redemption. And the Holy Spirit, in fact, if you're a believer, has not let you get away with it already because any time if you do think about how you feel that irritation, if he prompts you, you will excuse yourself. We're excellent at justifying ourselves. We're, we, we understand how we felt and what we meant and what took place and so often don't understand what may have been the dynamics that brought about however inappropriate, however insensitive, however unkind, however even cruel. The situation nonetheless does not allow for me to make an evaluation on at what point I cease being a forgiver. My having received forgiveness of the love of God in Jesus Christ has removed entirely my ability to exercise any judgment against anyone else in terms of my willingness to release forgiveness. Having been forgiven so great a debt. Jesus makes that so very clear in the story of the unforgiving servant and I won't take time to go over that narrative. But the fact is that there's one point right there that I will tell you as I speak the words. There are people in the room the Lord is speaking to you about that. That may be the sum of the message for you tonight. It may be the point of focus. It may be the introduction of other things. There are things that the Lord will speak to us and has spoken earlier about service. I remember the many years early in my, it was in my youth, my mid-teen years, when I knew I was called to ministry. In fact, I can never remember a time in my life I didn't know I was supposed to be a pastor. My earliest recollections, nobody ever told it to me. I knew I was supposed to be a pastor. In fact, it's uh, almost humorous uh, because I knew God didn't know this was the heart of an eight-year-old boy. But I remember one time when I was eight years old that they were giving an invitation to go to the altar at the end of a vacation Bible school week of sessions. And I didn't go forward for one reason. Not because I didn't believe Jesus was the Savior, not because I didn't want Jesus as my Savior. I didn't go forward because I knew if I did that, that I would have to be a pastor because I already knew I was supposed to be a pastor. I just didn't want to be a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not really, that's not really it. I just, I just didn't want to take the step where I knew by committing to the Savior, by committing to the Savior that I would step into a life that would disallow me being anything else than what I knew he as Lord would want me to be. And so I did when I was 10 years old, open my heart to the Lord. But in fact, I will tell you for what uh, comfort it may be to anybody and it's unnecessary because I'm safe. I did receive the Lord when I was 10 and I want you to know I stand here as a person who is a believer in Jesus Christ. But, uh, and, and a preacher for that matter, and a pastor for 56 years. But uh, at any rate, uh, I've, at that time, I uh, also knew that when I was five years old, I came home from a Sunday school, and my parents told me this later, that I told them I had asked Jesus into my heart when I was in Sunday school that day. I don't remember that as being the time that I, with understanding, received the Lord, but I believe that child's heart that also innocently made the choice when he was eight years old, probably was under the cover of Calvary. But if that's difficult for you to receive theologically, well, we can talk about it after the service. Uh, you, you won't win. The, uh, <laughs> Most seriously, what is the point? 
The point is that the Lord calls us to serve. He calls us to things that sometimes we fear. With Mary, she doubted her sufficiency or adequacy. She would say, how can this be? And she makes the obvious observation. You're talking about having a baby since I don't, I don't, I've never had a husband, never been with a man. The very thing she, saw, she thought was her weakness, which was fundamentally her qualification because she wouldn't have been approached if she hadn't been a virgin because the prophecy called for a virgin. Consider the possibility that something you feel you're incapable of is in itself your very qualification for why the Lord is choosing you because he wants to show himself strong through you and rejoice you. She will sing nine months from now, my soul does magnify the Lord because she discovers things God could do that transcend her imagination, the amazement of the goodness of God through her. But in the meantime, it was not convenient because she will conceive. The answer to the question, however, is the same answer today. How can this be? Well, the angel answers and says, the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. It is not by might ever, or by power ever, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And the ability and the capacity the Holy Spirit will give to any one of us for the simplest obedience, no matter however impossible it seems to us, because it is usually the impossible side of the summons that preoccupies us. And he's saying to you, I'm only asking you to respond. When you come to the end of this text, she will say, be it unto me according to thy word. Because she's come of the persuasion of what the angel also said. Well, when God gives a word, there is the power attendant to it, inherent in it. When he said, let there be light, there was not a voice in the darkness somewhere saying, no. Or did not say, how can there be light? There was power in the word that became light. The word carries with it the power to bring it about. Now, I must begin to press at this point, seriously, of who there may be in this house tonight that the Lord would be speaking to you before you ever even got here. He may have spoken to you months or even years ago about a particular issue as he did to me and that little boy, which I finally, some years later, did come to a point of dealing with it. I was 16 when I answered the summons of the Lord to ministry. I'd received the Lord when I was 10. But I had the good sense to know that my salvation did not depend upon that act of obedience to answering a call to ministry. But I did, of course. Tonight, I'm thinking about Mary once the miracle started working in her, however, and there is a price because of what happens. You know, the becoming pregnant with a promise, not pregnant as Mary became pregnant, but pregnant in your life as the Lord begins to stretch you, <laughs> it will stretch you. Coming to open up to what God wants to do redemptively through you will stretch you. And I say stretch I'm thinking right now of my wife who is just about five feet tall. And uh, she is the mother of four children, the grandmother of 11, the great-grandmother of 12, the wife of an old man. <laughs> she had four children. The total weight of those four children is just over 42 pounds. She's a short lady. The first one weighed just under eight pounds. The second two weighed just a little over 10. The last one weighed 12 pounds, one and a half ounces. She was as big as a blimp. <laughs> this svelte little woman that I met in college just walked with a dainty and said, she's Listen to me. You open up to God's redemptive purpose in you will change the way you walk. <laughs> It'll also change what you eat, what your intake is. It'll change your diet. 
a woman who has any respect for the fetus is going to be careful, of her, especially careful of her diet during the time she's carrying the child. We begin to weigh things differently as the weight of the burden of responsibility increases when you open up and begin to serve what God has for you by the reason of redemptive grace in you. This uh, choice of Mary to open up is in the words we said, be it unto me. I open to the promise of the power of the Holy Spirit. It will bring about the entry of the world's redeemer. There is one more thing. That when it comes to the time of delivery, and isn't it interesting, by the way, of the parallel terms that we use, we talk about redemptive entry. We're talking about something inconceivable becoming conceived something you can't imagine happening through you or God doing something transcendent to human power by his power, and we open up to it. That human power cannot conceive or generate strength to bring it about, but he says, I want to use you as the instrument through whom I will incarnate my power and life, which will be the life of his son in you, and it's Christ in you, the hope of that glory of the victory of seeing redemptive things happen through you. It's his grace and power. It's his Holy Spirit's power. It's the capacities beyond ourselves, and it's through the confrontation of whatever it is he's dealing with you about. I know the way that the Lord gave me this message, ignited it to my heart this morning. I brought the message before. It goes back to that time years ago, and I brought it a number of places. But the reason for now is because of the sense of the Spirit saying, there are people there to whom I will speak and that I will say, this is what I'm wanting to enlarge you to receive. Open your heart to receive and open to what I will grow in you, in you, and deliver through you. And speaking in terms of deliver, just as we use the term conceive or concept for conception, as well as something entering our mind and saying, Yes, I will open to that by the promise of the power of the Spirit. Give myself to it. I'll say yes, Lord, to the truth of your word. I can only conceive of it because you say the promised power is there. But there's one other aspect of it, and it's the actual delivery. And there is no such thing as a bloodless delivery of a child. In other words, something of life flows out. Something of yourself is poured into it. And this whole thing is so clearly the paradigm on which all redemptive entry takes place. That is not a matter of stretching or playing with the case here. It's recognizing in a very real sense, if you will, God wants to, would you hear me and with understanding, he wants to impregnate in our spirits, in our souls, every one of us at points of summons. He wants us to receive the seed of the word tonight when Gabriel came, he said, the Lord is with you. And he came as the angel of the Lord announcing that there would be no end of the rule that God would bring about. There would come such an entry of something God would do through Messiah that would extend the rule of God till eventually as the waters cover the sea, so the glory of the Lord cover the earth. We never have any idea. Abraham was told that in your seed the nations of the earth will be blessed. None of you have any idea what God may be wanting to do through just the seed that comes to us saying, will you receive my awaking you to, and then at that point, the message becomes you finish the sentence or the paragraph. What does he speak to you about? What has he been speaking to you about? It may be for a long time. It may be reinforced. In fact, it could have come with a jibe, almost though an elbow on the ribs, when earlier I talked about forgiveness of someone and something. But dear ones, as we gather in this house tonight, the Lord says, I want my redemption to spread further, and I'm looking for avenues through whom it can spread. And the pattern by which that takes place is inherent in the original point 
of actual incarnate redemptive entry. It came in the form of his son, but he happened through a human being, miraculously. And it's plain people like you and me who open to him that he miraculously works redemptive grace. And the pattern, I think, is always the same. It costs something of our availability and our willingness to say, I need power beyond me for it. But I say, yes, be it unto me according to thy word. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? Lord, I want to thank you for the friends in this house tonight with whom I open the word, with whom I've worshipped, with whom we have thought gathered together around the truth of your word. And I pray that you would let there come a ready response even now. I'd like to ask us all grant the courtesy to one another of our heads bowed. But I would like to uh, precipitate a moment of response just to this one proposition. How many are there in the room who would say, Jack, I, 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 I know the Lord, and I, but I know he's spoken to me tonight about something. He's reminding me of something, or he brought something up just this evening, just now. And I know that this is a moment in which I need to say, Lord, I'm, I'm hearing this word, and I want you to know I'm opening to it. I think, frankly, there's many of us of whom that's true but all over the room. Would you lift your hand right now if you say, there's things the Lord spoke to me. Just hold it up right there all over the room. There are many of us that he says, yes, this is you. And just, Father God, as each of these respond, we say, be it unto us according to your word. Work through us what you will. And I ask that you give an abiding sense of accountability to your word tonight. In the name of Yeshua, and let's lower your hand, if you will. Let's continue at prayer. And Pastor Wynn, would you come? And I'd like you to extend invitation and guidance to any who may need to receive the Lord as Savior or other response you would beckon for the message itself. Let's uh, go ahead, if you'll come. Let's re remain at prayer as he comes. With gratitude, Lord, we wait on you as your word takes its place of lodging in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you're here tonight. We thank you for the word that has been brought forth by a messenger. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to come among us tonight. We don't take that for granted. But we know, Lord, you didn't come into this room just to hover above us, but you want to come into us. And not even just corporately, but individually, you want to come and live in us the Messiah in us, the hope of glory. And Lord, for those who are in this place who have never invited you to come into their hearts, I pray that this would be the night, for today is the day of salvation. We pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would come and do the work that he does to convict us of, our, of missing the mark, of not reaching your standard of sinning, we pray, Lord, that you would show us that you are the Redeemer, and that you have come to save and to set free and to bring deliverance through us. Lord, I pray for the, the one who doesn't know you tonight, that he or she would say, come, Lord, into my life. Take charge. Sit on your throne of my heart. And it is as simple as that, folks, is to say, Lord, come and be my master. Come and be Lord of my life. And recognize that you're not in charge of your life. I'm not in charge of my life. He's in charge. And that you would invite him to come and be Lord and master. And he's not a hard task master. He's a loving shepherd who wants to carry you. He wants to lead you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to make something great in you, through you. If there's anyone in this place who has never received Yeshua, Jesus, as Lord, this is the night.
If the Holy Spirit is prompting you, you sense something in your heart tugging and pulling and saying, come, say yes to me. Would you receive him? Would you say yes tonight? Musicians, you can play and no one's looking around. Is there anyone who has sensed that tugging on your, in your heart tonight and you want to receive Jesus as your Savior? Would you raise your hand? We want to pray with you. We want to show you. We want to walk with you. We want to help you and show you the way to be a disciple of the Master.